Hello and welcome to Castle's Corner. I'm Coach Castle, and today it's all about the deadlift. Does it have any application at all? Is it a good movement? The difference between conventional and sumo. Which muscles are actually trained? Who should do the deadlift? Is there a time and a place to do it? I don't do the deadlift. It's been about 10 years now since I touched a barbell. Which exercises are more efficient for the muscles you're attempting to train with the deadlift and how to do them? Well, we're getting into all of that, the science, the breakdown, the biomechanics of what actually happens and why people do them and why they need to stop. Let's get into the math, the breakdown, and the muscles. Here we go. By the way, just a quick little tip. Deadlifts, if you're, if you're deadlifting to be a better deadlifter, fine. If you're not doing that for deadlift's sake, then don't fucking do it. The risk-to-reward ratio is a joke. For deadlifts? For deadlifts. Really? And a lot of people aren't going to like that I'm saying that. But if you go into any NFL uh, gym, in any Division One college football gym, in any athletics where people are actually getting paid and it matters what they're doing, they're not deadlifting. First things first, let's look at the conventional deadlift, wide stance deadlift, and trap bar deadlift and see what muscles are actually worked, and then we'll compare them all. In order to perform the deadlift, you of course must contract muscles. This is why you do things like the deadlift, because you're attempting to build and strengthen those particular muscle groups. Now when most people attempt to build muscle using the deadlift, they're generally speaking attempting to target their glutes, their quads, their hamstrings, their calves, and perhaps some back muscles like their erector spinal and lats. The deadlift is tooted as a wonderful full body building exercise, wonderful for training all the muscles on your body. This is of course not the case, as we'll be getting into. Does it target these muscle groups? Yes, it does. However, not efficiently at all. So the first one we're going to talk about is the sumo deadlift. Now, just like all the other variations, you're trying to target the glutes, quads, hamstrings, calves, the stabilizers of your core, lats, and erector spinal. However, we don't know how much each one of these muscle groups is being loaded, besides it's not being loaded adequately, or in a correct resistance curve, or in any productive way, really. The sumo deadlift in particular is ego lifting at its finest. The amount of weight that you have in the bar is completely irrelevant to how much you're loading the actual muscle. This is because the muscles are loaded by the levers, or your bones, which are interacting with gravity. The sumo deadlift in particular basically only has you moving the weight on the bar several inches with your joints having maximal mechanical disadvantage, or basically being nine times stronger in this position, requiring you to barely move at all. In case anybody was wondering, this is only for competition, and in no way, shape, or form will this be productively growing muscle. The next one to talk about would be the conventional deadlift. Now, of course, just like the sumo deadlift, you're targeting exactly all the same muscle groups. The only difference is you are slightly, and I do mean slightly, targeting your glutes and your quadriceps in a slightly superior manner, meaning you'll be getting a little bit more time under tension on them, and you'll be getting a little bit more range of motion inside the resistance curve. The downside is that the risk to reward is even worse, though. This is because the longest lever is going to be your spine and your spine is the most active lever, meaning most of the load from the actual movement itself is being delivered directly into your erector spinal. Not your legs, not your glutes, not your hamstrings or your quads, none of the muscles you're trying to train. It's being delivered into the erector spinal, the muscle which is holding or contracting against the resistance to keep your spine straight. This is not a good movement for your legs once again. The only difference between this and the sumo is it has slightly more range of motion, and it's slightly worse for your back. All right, the final one to talk about will be the trap bar deadlift. Now this is the most comfortable for most people, as well as I suppose the safest of the three, as well as the best, I suppose, of the three, even though being the best of a bad bunch doesn't really mean much. The reason it's slightly better than the other two is your hands are in a neutral position, which is much safer for your arms and biceps, number one. Number two, you can hit slightly lower depth because your hands are not in front of your body, but rather beside you, meaning your glutes and your quads will get slightly better resistance curve as well as slightly more loading and time under tension. Your lower back won't be stressed quite as much as well because again of the placement, even though it'll still be getting stressed. Once again, not a good movement if you're trying to train any one of these muscles. Each one of these muscles should have its own independent movement specifically training that muscle group within its ideal direction. We'll be getting into that now. 
For simple demonstrational purposes, here's a bicep. Now, just try to think about the rest of the skeletal muscles on your body as being a bunch of little biceps, and it'll be easy to figure this out. Muscles can only pull insertion to origin, and they do so in a straight line. This is all the muscles do. They're responsible for these very simple actions of contracting in a straight line. They do so concentrically and eccentrically, and of course, isometrically as well. Now, once again, they do this in a straight line, and they have a best resistance curve. Now, most people think of the bicep as being made something like this, but in reality, as we know, the bicep actually connects really close to the elbow, and it contracts, again, in a straight line. I'm going to keep saying that. And it does this by the muscle sliding theory. Basically, what happens is your muscle fibers are being pulled towards each other as you're performing a muscle contraction. Again, just consider all the muscles on your body to be biceps and you'll get the right idea. They slide towards each other, which is why the muscle looks like it bunches up as it contracts. And as it elongates, it stretches out again. This is how all muscles on your body work. Now understand that the hamstrings is exactly like the bicep. It is a bilateral muscle made of two different muscle groups which connect on one point and insert on another point. When you're performing a deadlift, you're essentially contracting the hamstring at the very most, possibly an inch. This is not productive in terms of muscle growth. This is the equivalent of you doing a lying down bicep curl with a dumbbell and extending your arm slightly behind your back and then raising it up again. This is not something that you would be doing to grow your bicep. This is not an efficient movement nor an efficient contraction. So why would you do it for your hamstrings? For the hamstrings, instead of this terribly compromised movement which adds no real benefit to them, you could instead do this very simple movement which while it looks like a bicep curl, it's because it's basically a bicep curl. As you can see, your hamstring is beginning with a fully stretched or elongated muscle and ending with a fully contract muscle. It's even doing it very similar to what a bicep curl would look like. That's your first indicator this is a good movement for your hamstring. Of course, notice a bent at the waist to remove active insufficiency and get full contraction in the muscle. You could, of course, use the lying hamstring curl as well, or simply attach a dumbbell to your foot, or the uh, seated hamstring curl machine as well. These are all very productive, very good exercises to be using to grow your hamstrings and make them stronger. Another one of the primary muscles that you're attempting to target during these exercises, like squats and deadlifts, is of course the glutes. Now the glutes have an origin and an insertion, and think of it as being a multi-layered bicep. It does multiple things, but primarily it brings the upper leg back towards the upper part of the pelvis and it rotates the bone a bit in the socket. Now that being said, there are some wonderful exercises like this one here, which allow you to start at a mechanical disadvantage with an elongated muscle and contract fully into a position of mechanical advantage, just like as if it was a bicep. Of course, there are many different exercises such as this. Here we have the cable pull. Same exact thing, just different range of motion. If you're not as stable with the cables, just do an, an elevated step up, keeping your back straight. The next muscle to address will be the quads. Of course, we're going to be wanting to pull origin to insertion into straight lines, starting once again mechanical disadvantage and elongated muscle, and ending with a fully contracted muscle at a mechanical advantage. The exercises best suited to this are one-legged squats, Cossack squats, of course, things like leg extensions or sissy squats, these maximally load your quadriceps using leg of magnification and load magnification to your advantage, not needing to damage yourself with a heavy barbell. As you can clearly see, the erector spinal, the next muscle we'll be talking about, is the primarily loaded muscle when performing the deadlift. The reason for this, it is the longest lever, as you can see in both variations, both stiff leg and bent leg. And by being the longest lever, it's the most active and the most loaded. However, the spine itself is made up of many different vertebrae, which in order to be trained properly, need to be able to contract independently to form a full contraction. So here you can see a simple version lying on a bench. There are, of course, many other different versions you can do for it, such as this one here, which is really just a Superman, but contracting against resistance. But all in all, this is a very important muscle to be training, and it's not really possible to be training it when you're isometrically holding it and turning it essentially into a lever. 
Throughout the video, I've mentioned several times how the deadlift any variation is very high risk and low reward. This is because of, of course, the compression of the vertebrae, the ligaments in the back, and many other different things we're about to be getting into. But why do we do this? We could very easily curl our back, or we could very easily maintain it straight and rigid. When do we use one or the other? Is there a best time? Is there even a time that we should be deadlifting? Well, just understand that when you're deadlifting, the pelvis is high, and the load in the leg muscles is low. This is because of the position of the pelvis and positions of levers. You're forced to rely on the ligament's passive tissue to hold the static activity of the spinal extensors. These ligaments are unable to withstand interior shear force, and neither can the muscles of a flexed spine. When the spine is neutral, the lumbar erectors have the ability to produce posterior shear force, meaning to reduce the interior shear forces holding itself stable. One of the most common mistakes made when doing any form of lifting is rounding the back, which of course creates a serious risk in damaging the lumbar vertebrae or ligaments. The deadlift is suitable for heavy weights if you're able to keep your back straight and hold the load as close to your body as possible. I usually use the example of an atlas stone because most people know what that looks like. This principle is very important when lifting weights or furniture or any other day-to-day -day activity where you'd be lifting something heavy. Another variation of the deadlift is one with arm support for lifting heavy objects. Or you can essentially you just squat, keeping the weight near the body and keeping the back, once again, straight, using the erector spinal muscles to stabilize the spine, holding it neutral. Then another option is, of course, the lunge with one arm support. This support is basically just resting on the arm, directing the force into the ground. Bend the knee and keep the back straight. This variation is like the squats, but with the legs closer together. Now on the left, you can see the movement that is not recommended, and that's because it creates ongoing damage to the lower back. But on the right, you can see careful maintenance of the straight back. Now, what about light objects and forward bending of the spine during day-to-day -day activities? Well, bending forward is not a bad thing in your daily life, and it's very important movement to be kept and maintained in many occasions. Such as when you're picking up objects off the floor that are very light, you're tying shoes, you're, uh, you know, whatever small things, playing with your kids, kitten, not a dog that weighs 60 pounds. But again, very simple, just use your best judgment when picking something up. You know how strong you are, you know your flexibility better than anyone else, and of course you should be working on it and establishing your limits anyways. I hope that you liked that video. I just wanted to remind you all, if you're able to and you support my work, please make sure that you like the video, you subscribe if you haven't already, you click the notification bell and you share this video or leave a comment to help the algorithm. Every little bit helps and I'm trying to get this information to as many people as is possible. And of course, if I can help you with any of your coaching needs, you need a running plan, you need a workout plan, you want to build mass, you want to lose weight, you want to do things correctly, you want a full education about your diet, your exercise, your respiratory health, supplements, and everything else, just contact me at castlinprogress.com or via my email, castlinprogress at gmail.com. If you don't want coaching directly, just check out my Etsy store. It's linked in the description of all of my videos. I have all of my many books, tools, and everything else there. Or finally, check out my Substack. It's linked in a lot of the videos as well. And it's free, a free newsletter where I share the latest science, advice, exercises, and everything else for free. So thank you as always for your support, everyone.